Now that we just covered positivism and all the reasons why uh, people in the West, particularly uh, in England and the United States, sort of uh, emphasized science and, and reason as the uh, means to achieving or pursuing truth and objective truth. And they believed that reason and science could, in unison, be used to find like these objective truths too about how the world operates uh, and these universal laws and, and, and figure out exactly what the world is uh, metaphysically and, and realistically uh, and, and apply that going forward. Uh, and again, that was in, in primarily in England and in the United States. In France and Germany, it was a bit more mixed, particularly Germany. In fact, Germany uh, is kind of the center of the counter-enlightenment movement. I mentioned it earlier with their, uh, you know, particular uh, excitement for uh, nationalism. Not that France didn't or others didn't, but they were particularly uh, attached to it in Germany. Uh, and one of the reasons why is because that German philosophy and that what they call continental philosophy, so like, you know, France, Germany, basically not England and the United States, uh, they are going to develop into, and again, in Germany primarily, this very counter-enlightenment belief that rejects science and reason as possible solutions uh, to figuring out exactly how the world is and finding objective truth uh, that, that applies to uh, all people in times, regardless of experiencing it or not. Um, they're going to uh, reject that in favor of increasingly uh, those romantic themes, which is why romanticism is really continentally centered, although there are, of course, people in the United States and, and in England that adopt some of those beliefs and, and take them into uh, Anglo-American uh, philosophy. Uh, but that, it's a bit more delayed. In Germany, though, in, in France, particularly Germany, it's going to be really strong. Um, so, again, there, there are themes here. Again, so this is very counter-enlightenment. So, uh, uh, continental and uh, particularly German here. It's, it doesn't just mean German. We're focusing on them right now. Um, philosophy is, at this point, um, starting with probably Rousseau as the first counter-enlightenment person during the Enlightenment. Uh, and then also Kant in Germany, so that's France and Germany. Uh, and there's others too, and, and a guy named Hegel. Uh, they're the, the primary people that opposed enlightenment uh, emphasis on reason and science uh, in favor of feeling and intuition um, as like their primary uh, sources of meaning for people. Uh, and when we get to, um, uh, not that they weren't already hinted at, and at this guy that borrow heavily from uh, Rousseau, and especially Kant and Hegel, uh, which are again previous philosophers, uh, and if you want to know about them, you can look them up. If I went over all of the Western philosoph philosophical history, it would take forever. Um, but we're jumping into this one guy. So I just want you to know who he's influenced by, this guy. So cognitive philosophy, uh, their emphasis is going to be increasingly in France and Germany um, that science and reason uh, cannot uh, provide truth uh, because these can only provide truth through either experiencing and observing it or uh, by using our... Uh, logical, rational components of our brain. And they're going to argue that um, these are perceptual limitations, meaning something may or may not be true before or after us or exist permanently or universally uh, if it's based on observation because uh, we're looking for cause and effect. Um, and also, uh, our logic and reason is, is, a, is a facet of our brain uh, that we are uniquely able to use. And even though we might be able to use it to our advantage in, in our perception and in, in, in reality here on Earth. That doesn't mean that's the correct way or the only way or the complete way to analyze the universe and its meaning and, and how it works. Um, so they're going to doubt that. Uh, and instead, beginning especially with Nietzsche, not specifically with him, but he makes it quite explicit at this point. Um, they cannot provide, provide truth. So instead, what they seek for truth is, again, a lot of those romantic themes, uh, but, uh, but instead, emphasize intuition and uh, feeling, so emotion, as uh, um, sources of truth. Or I should say truths, because they don't believe that, or at least Nietzsche doesn't believe that there's like one specific one. All right, and uh, that's who, by the way, we're gonna be talking about, is a guy named uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich, if I can spell. All right, if you can't tell by his name, he is also German. He was, uh, I think it was 1844 to 1900? Basically mid 19th century to, to about 1900, if the exact years are wrong. Oh well. This is roughly though when he was alive and around. 
Uh, and he's going to be the one that's going to, uh, and again, this already started with Rousseau and especially Kant and Heigl, but, and he's going to borrow from them, but he's the one that most explicitly is going to state this sort of problem. And he's the one that's going to uh, directly challenge objective truth. And again, that's what we mean by objective truth is something that is true regardless of my experience of it or not. Like it existed in the universe before humans, it exists during uh, our existence and it'll exist after humans. Uh, and nothing can, I guess you would say, change it. It can be discovered perhaps or thought of, but it exists for all people or all parts of the universe at all times um, in all situations and speeds and things like that, uh, which we're gonna find is actually impossible. So uh, Nietzsche's the first one to say it philosophically. And this is before they had a really uh, solid basis for challenging the scientific perspective. Because uh, keep in mind, um, well, actually, I actually haven't told you this yet, I guess, at least not this video. It's not until 1901, 1905 that science really begins to break down Newton's uh, and classical uh, mechanical understandings of the uh, universe. So Nietzsche's proposition here is um, objective knowledge, at least for humans, uh, likely doesn't exist. Or I should say he discredits it. Objective knowledge. Uh, doesn't exist. He does, of course, admit that it perhaps could, uh, but he's unaware of it. Uh, and he hasn't disproved it, but he certainly made it seem like uh, none of the answers that humans have are anywhere near um, uh, correct as far as finding some objective truth, some objective thing that is morally true or good for everyone um, and, and, and transcends human existence or experience. So, objective knowledge doesn't exist, but rather subjective perceptions. So, what do I mean by that? That's what I'll try to be getting, uh, making clear uh, throughout this video is, he basically believes that each person sort of has like this drive, this desire to, to be meaningful. Like, I'm not just some random, uh, blob of moving molecules on a rock in space that uh, has no actual significance in the universe and that my existence and cease, ceasing to exist have, have no uh, impact overall on the universe, on making anything good or, or worse. Uh, and that whatever we feel or think is uh, correct or good is to us, but not to other people. Um, and you could think about that kind of as like tastes and preferences, but it's more than that. It's more than just like, I like black and you like purple. It's, um, this is the way to live uh, life uh, to make it uh, a good, moral, virtuous, productive, fulfilling life. Uh, what that means to me is different than what that means to you or, or another person. Uh, that's kind of what he's going to assert here. Uh, and he's largely, he's largely correct in that assertion. So well, let's start with what he said. Uh, he says a lot of things, first of all, but the one that you've probably heard before uh, is his uh, infamous quote. And this is an incomplete quote, by the way. It's basically a paragraph, but people take these first few uh, letters. Um, God is dead. And I believe the following line is, line is, and we have killed him, or we have, we're responsible in some way. We have killed him. Or it. All right. So he didn't actually mean like we, we've gone up and, and gutted this beard man in the sky uh, or anything like that. He doesn't specifically mean the Judeo-Christian God, although obviously that's the dominant religion and figure in um, uh, Europe, certainly. Um, and in this point in time, starting to be, if not already, the world, but certainly in Europe, uh, he actually means all religions and all explanations for how you should live your life um, and what gives it meaning. Like, uh, why, you, why you get up in the morning, go out and do the things you do, uh, and toil and, and, and work and suffer throughout the day and suffer loss and pain and hunger, uh, and then try to avoid dying and spend your whole life doing that. Like, what, what, what gives us meaning? Uh, and he says that uh, we've sort of killed all of the traditional explanations for, for what life means. Uh, and again, he focuses a lot on, on Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian beliefs because it's Europe, but he also means Hinduism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Islam, any uh, set of beliefs that says this is how the world works, this is what you should do, and this is why it is meaningful to do that, right? So we all have explanations in various religions or even people and philosophies 
as to uh, why we exist and, and, and what should we do. So like, you know, the, the Hindu beliefs are about uh, you uh, fulfilling your, your varna, your duty, uh, so that you accrue positive karma. And in the next life, you move up uh, a tier in the caste system. And the ultimate goal is going all the way up to the top of that, uh, fulfilling your dharma, and then your, your, your soul merges with, with Brahman in the universe, and you've ended this cycle of, of reincarnation uh, and suffering. Right? And they all have different explanations for that. Uh, the monotheistic religions, uh, Islam, Judaism, Second Temple Judaism, um, even Zoroastrianism and Christianity, it's, it's all kind of a similar formula in that you're born, there's this presence of good and evil and temptation, and your objective is to lead whatever that religion defines as a good, virtuous life. And in doing so, you hope to help out the good uh, and end up in, in some sort of paradise or heaven. Uh, that's sort of the meaning for life. And he says all of those are BS, essentially. Uh, he is going to uh, reject those ideas. So he's going to explicitly reject what we call uh, true world explanations or meanings. And that's just a way of saying how religions claim this is how the world works and this is what you do and this is your goal. That's what they mean by true world. Like, this is how it is. It doesn't matter... Uh, so if I'm, I'm Islamic, for example, I'm, I'm going to say it doesn't matter if you believe in Judaism or Hinduism. Uh, Islam is how the world works. And if you don't do it this way, you're going to end up in, in hell. Uh, or if you're you know, a Hindu person, it doesn't matter if you're uh, Jainist or if you're Confucian or if you're a uh, Christian. This is how the world works. And if you don't do it properly, uh, you're going to end up suffering. That's what I mean by true world. Like Regardless of whether you believe it or not, it's there. Uh, and even though we can't see it or test or observe it, it, it exists whether or not we are there. Uh, that's a true world explanation. So again, his big target here is Judeo-Christianity, but it's all religions and explanations for how the world works. Um, so he rejects it. He says, no, uh, those don't exist. And he actually, uh, very uh, astutely, I guess you could say, he's going to say, but I know why these, um, oh, how can I phrase this? I know why these systems exist. So, uh, his, so here's his first you know, statement, his first challenge. He challenges objective knowledge that there's like one way the world works and one thing you should do to be moral and, and fulfilling and, and, and this overall goal in your life. Uh, but he understands why. And I think I'll probably make up the second point here. And he makes that clear in his writings. He states, um, Nietzsche says he understands why uh, people create these systems. And they're generally faith-based, too, by the way, which is fine, actually. Uh, the German philosophers are fine with faith. Uh, that's actually one of their cruxes, too, is institute, institution, intuition, feeling, and, and, and faith, because they believe that if there is a truth or whatever the explanation for truth is, that uh, it's, it's like metaphysical. It doesn't exist so that we can test it uh, or observe it or apply cause and effect. Our reason and our science uh, cannot actually find it. That's the whole continental movement. Um, so he understands why people create these um, ideas for about how the world works, even though there's no evidence for it, uh, because um, because we are psychologically driven, psychologically driven, to have meaning. And this, by the way, was uh, one of the main points made by a lot of the the, the uh, religious folk, uh, the uh, theologians, uh, or anyone, any adherent of Christianity or Islam or whoever. When these uh, scientific and rational ideas started coming out of the Enlightenment and people started becoming more atheistic or at least agnostic, uh, you know, acknowledging maybe there's a God, but I don't know about it, so I can't pick one, um, and then, or atheistic denying that any God exists and it's just us in this material world. One of their main objectives that not only Nietzsche makes, but even those theologians make is that, well, okay, let's say you're right and there is no God, then what, why are we doing what we're doing? Like, there's no good or bad, I can do whatever I want then. If I go and kill somebody and take their stuff, there's no divine retribution. I'm not going to go to hell for it. You might punish me, I guess. But if I can get away with it, then then who cares? So a lot of these guys, uh, prior to Nietzsche, are going to point out that oh, even if uh, even if there is no explanation for that, you still feel guilty. And we know now, of course, because of psychology, that these are all evolutionary uh, um, uh, mechanisms that we've inherited across time that drive us and make us either feel guilty for doing something you would consider bad or 
drive us to find meaning or drive us to, to not die and, and find something to do to keep living and, and spread our genes. We actually know that those are, those are actually uh, uh, psychological. Uh, and he's going to be one of the first people to sort of point that out. He's a philosopher. Um, but he and um, also a guy named uh, Dostoevsky uh, are going to be kind of the first ones to really psychologically analyze people. And then, of course, you're going to have people explicitly doing that with, with like Freud, which we'll talk about next. But uh, So he's going to say, I know why people are looking for this meaning and trying to explain how the world works, because we all feel like we need to have a purpose, that our, our life is meaningful. It, it, things happen for a reason, right? So when bad things happen, it's hard to be like, oh, well, it's just random, I guess. I guess I have bad luck. No, people like to think that there's a reason why something bad happened. Like, oh, I was being tested by God, or, uh, oh, it's to make something else better, like, oh, I got sick, but, you know, that's going to allow this person to come in and blossom, or they're going to find a cure for me, uh, even though I end up dying for this. Uh, they, they, they get close to a cure and say, many of the people, they try to find reasons why they're suffering. That makes them sort of resilient. So he understands that we need these reasons um, psychologically, uh, and that they uh, give us, give us uh, resilience. To uh, uh, push past suffering. I know it's hard to understand nowadays because our lives are, well, just frankly, they're easy compared to how human life has been, um, you know, in the 1800s and certainly before the 1800s. Um, it, it's easy to take for granted, but, um, and, you, and, and we all still do suffer too. You have, you know, psychological disorders people deal with, and, you know, not everybody has a perfect upbringing or access to all these wonderful things. Uh, but generally, especially in the West, lives are pretty easy. We're not generally worried about dying or starving on a daily basis. Um, and this was the reason why people would progress through hardship, because life was, and it still is, but it was much harder uh, before. And these sort of beliefs kept people going forward. It's like, well, I might be suffering, and it might be really hard, but it's for a good reason, uh, because I'm making the world better by, by you know, acting on the side of the good, or like I said, if something bad happens to me, there's a reason for it. Like, I'll grow personally, or they'll discover something with my illness that'll save thousands of people or millions of people later. They, they try to come up with these reasons. So uh, this sort of gives us the resilience uh, to push on. And he goes further and explain that too. Uh, <clears throat> I might be getting too in depth here, but I do want to give at least those of you that care to understand how this all works and make sense of it and remember it, uh, the explanation. He used um, Judeo-Christian beliefs as an example uh, for this. He said, okay, so this is why. So these, these, um, all these explanations are, 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 are fake, essentially. Not fake, but they think they're real, but they're only real to the people that believe them. Uh, but he knows why we do it, because we have this need for, for meaning. So he gives an example. He says, uh, well, first of all, he believes that there's kind of two types of people. There's people that, are, that have a master uh, mentality and those that have a slave mentality. And uh, the masters, and, and this is just another psychological analysis about how people are based on trait personality. People with a master type uh, personality, uh, they're very assertive. Uh, they uh, say what they want and they'll go after what they want. And if you get in their way, it doesn't mean they're gonna wipe you out, but they'll, they'll be persistent and then they'll you know, uh, really push whatever their agenda is and they're probably gonna get what they want. So they're assertive, they're powerful, and that can be a bit vague. I don't necessarily mean like they're just gonna by force come and take it from you, but they're powerful in that they are persistent, maybe they are capable of using physical force, or then maybe they're able to uh, 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 mobilize resources uh, against you or, or somebody else to get what they want. Um, so these are just typically the people you would see as the strong, uh, and they might also be uh, arrogant as well. And uh, those, those are just some features of what a, a person with a master mentality uh, our personality would be. Slaves, on the other hand, are, are quite the opposite. <clears throat> They're not assertive. Um, they are going to be passive. So those are the people that won't fight for what they want, or they might mention it, but as soon as it gets turned down, they'll, they'll kind of quit pursuing it, and the assertive, of course, will keep pursuing what they want, and they'll get it, and the, and the, the slave uh, mentality people will, will not. Um, they're passive. They're humble, right? They don't, they're not arrogant. They don't brag. Or, or they practice humility, I guess you should say. Uh, they're also uh, usually victims, uh, right? Because these ones are the ones that get the power and use it to get what they want. And these people are usually the ones that have to suffer what the strong want. And um, they, you know, of course, are, are denied usually what they want. Um, and they're just 
characterized as generally weak as rather than strong. So somebody who's a pushover, somebody who, uh, you know, if you want something and they want something, they'll back down, uh, whereas somebody who is more like this uh, will not. So he kind of characterized the world as these two people. And he points out that uh, these guys kind of live by their own rules to some extent. Now they might create a system that benefits them or enforce it, certainly. He's not saying they don't. Uh, but what he's going to say is a lot of these types of explanations for how the world works uh, come from a slave mentality. And he uses uh, Judaism and Christianity as examples of this. So he believes that Judeo-Christian um, mon monotheological beliefs uh, are slave religions or slave mentalities because he notes that the Jews and even Christians earlier on, they generally were being pushed around by some bigger civilization, whether it was Assyrians or Babylonians or even further back Egyptians or Romans or, or uh, the, the Caliphates, whoever it was, they were getting sort of bullied around. They had their moments in history, of course, but they were largely bullied and controlled by other people. So they didn't have the ability, the Jewish people, to uh, practice these things. Like they weren't able to, oh, I forgot to mention wealth is one of the things that most of the strong have because they're willing to go out and get it. And then the slaves, of course, are generally uh, on the poor side. So what he believes is since these uh, slave mentality uh, people, Jews, Christians, whoever it might be, uh, and he'll certainly point that out to, uh, you know, Buddhism and things like that too, if you were to analyze them. Uh, he's going to point out that what they do is they, they can't exist believing that um, they're just pathetic and can't get what they want. Uh, but they, but they can't. So they, they can't reconcile that. So they have this desire for meaning. They're denied what they actually want because of, of who they are. So what they're going to do is they're going to create or make up a, a system of morals, a true world system for how the world is and how you should live. Are they going to base it on these things? No, because they aren't assertive. They aren't powerful. They don't have wealth. They aren't strong. They aren't arrogant. But what are they? They are passive and humble, and they are victims, and they are weak and generally poor. So what things do you think they're going to make their... Uh, uh, religion based around, and he points out these things. He's like, well, if my life is characterized by passivity and being humble uh, and victims and weak and poverty, uh, I'm going to make those things virtues. And I'm going to say these things uh, are evils, All right? So he's saying essentially they're making it up because they can't get these things, but they have to act, but they have the psychological need to uh, have a meaningful life. They're going to just invent a system. Uh, that says these are good things and these are bad things and because they only have these good things or they only have these things uh, They're gonna make those the good things the virtues So they create these slave mentality religions where the virtues the good things right the moral things uh, are things like um, uh, Denial of uh, or not being materialistic so uh, anti-materialistic Right? It's good to give to the, to the poor, and, it, and it's actually evil. It's greedy to, to want wealth because that group of people doesn't have it. Right? So what's another thing that they could make a moral virtue? Uh, okay, um, weak. So they can't get what they want. They're often being pushed around and they're passive. So we'll make forgiveness and um, uh, nonviolence or passive, uh, being pacifist, pacificity. We're going to make those virtues as well. Uh, so forgiveness, uh, 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 pacificity. Uh, they generally don't get what they want, so you've got to be able to be willing to wait for it. So uh, we'll make um, uh, patience a virtue as well, because the strong just go out and get it. We either don't get it, we got to wait a long time. So we'll just make patience a virtue. Uh, and then lastly, um, what's the one I'm forgetting? Oh, humble. They'll make also uh, humility a virtue, right? So not bragging, not being arrogant, because those are things they don't possess, but they want to have meaning. So they're going to uh, what we call rationalize what meaning is. So rationalize could be you trying to explain something like why you did something, why you think something. Uh, and it can be just applying reason. Where did I write reason? It's up here somewhere. There it is. Uh, you might just be applying reason to actually explain how something works, but you also might be using it to try to twist um, an explanation so it fits what you believe is, is right, even though that might not be right. So here, for example, uh, they're trying to rationalize what are virtues? Like, oh, these are virtues because then they make up all these, you know, um, parables and verses and writings about why these are virtues and the opposite of these things, so evils, would be what? Greed, materialism, uh, aggression, right? That's the opposite of pacifism, 
a pac being pacifist. Uh, violence, I mean, we can all pretty much agree violence is, is bad, but you might need it at, at some times. Um, uh, assertiveness uh, and arrogance, they'll, they'll just label those things as, as immoral, and they'll, they'll find reasons to rationalize or justify that. All right, so what he's gonna point out is, no, these things aren't virtues, and maybe and probably these things aren't either. Uh, but both groups see them as virtuous. So the masters see these as great qualities to have, right? So whatever their um, uh, uh, true world theory is, they're probably focusing on these features because that's what they have. Uh, the slave mentality folk don't have those things. They only have these features. So they're going to create uh, a true world theory or uh, uh, a subjective explanation uh, for what is good and what is bad uh, to them. And those two groups are going to come up with two different explanations. So the question is, who is right? Um, you might be able to argue in this world that <clears throat> perhaps some of these features work better, but you probably have to use some of these as well. It might be a mix. But there is no answer for which is inherently, objectively good. Regardless of us existing or not, or our experience, which one of these is the answer? Uh, and the answer that, that Nietzsche poses, as well as previous um, philosophers um, along the uh, uh, continental um, uh, line of thought are going to say, no one can know. These things uh, are, are only observable uh, or, or rationalized through our human uh, thought processes and our observation. They aren't just metaphysically true uh, or existing regardless of humans being around or not. So the answer is there is no correct answer to that question. Which one of these are good or bad? There's no answer. It only it depends on your perspective. Are you a slave? Oh, well then you're going to think that these things are good. Are you uh, somebody who's above a master mentality? Oh, well, you're going to think those things are good. It depends on the person. All right, so if, if that made any sense at all, that's kind of his outline uh, for um, him attacking science, attacking reason, along with other uh, uh, continental philosophers going, uh, preceding him in, and then, of course, assisting and coming after. Uh, he's going to say, there is no objective truth to the world. We only come up with them because we have to find this sense of meaning. We have to have a, uh, something to look forward to, to push through all the suffering in the world. Uh, and so we create our own systems based on our own circumstances. Uh, so you can look at any religion and you can, you can find the historical reasons why they highlight certain features as being virtuous or being evil. And it always comes from a group that that's sort of their only choice. Right? Uh, I'm either this way or this way, according to Nietzsche, so I'm going to pick a system that fits the way I am um, so, that it, so that I can find myself a good, more moral, meaningful person. I can, can continue uh, to practice these things uh, because that's the right, good, virtuous thing to do. Right? Be me if I'm a slave mentality person. Uh, um, me being anti-materialistic, uh, me being uh, forgiving and uh, practicing uh, pacifism, being patient and humble. Um, those are good things that I need to keep doing because that's how uh, I lead a good life and I go to heaven or, or I uh, uh, end the cycle of reincarnation, whatever the explanation might be. Uh, so they're objective. He says they're made up based on the person and their circumstance. And he's largely right <clears throat> about that at least. Uh, but he actually goes a step further. He's actually going to accurately predict the problem that happens. Because when he says this line, by the way, God is dead and killed him, it wasn't like a celebration necessarily, although he does think this is overall a good thing, but I'll get there. Uh, he actually poses a stern warning uh, to, uh, to uh, any listeners, uh, and that is this, that it's, uh, it's at our own peril that we, we kill God. Because he was aware that people were increasingly skeptical of religion, but he's the only one uh, in the 19th century that's going to be like, whoa, 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 let's slow down because I see what we're doing here. We are, everyone's sort of rejecting this idea of religion and theology as being correct. Some are holding tight to it like Kant and other guys like Kierkegaard and even Heigl to a lesser extent with religion. But there, some people are holding to faith and intuition and emotion. Uh, but he notices most people are starting to reject them. So that's not um, unique. Most other people are, are also doing that. His unique feature is, uh, so like others, he's going to acknowledge Uh, the skepticism towards religion and that's not unique like others 
But, and here's where he is unique, where he almost acts as a prophet. He is the one, or at least the first, to uniquely, uniquely and explicitly lay out what he thinks will follow if we reject uh, God in all these traditional forms. So again, he's going to overall say this is a good thing, and, and I'll get there, but first he's going to issue a warning, and one that ends up being actually quite accurate. Uh, he says, but we, uh, at our own peril, reject these um, beliefs. Um, and his difference is, but uh, nihilis nihilistic suffering will follow. So nihilistic, by the way, it just basically means that the world and your life and all things are meaningless, which you could take as a good thing or a bad thing. And we'll get to how he thinks that's a good thing, by the way. But um, for most people, that's going to be a bad thing because, like he already pointed out, this is a deep psychological need. Uh, people yearn to have meaning. Uh, people, of course, need something to hold on to to be able to press through those hard times, which, of course, back then were a lot. And even today, depending on where you are and your situation in the world, could still be a lot. Um, people need that. And if they don't have that idea to latch onto, um, then they're going to, uh, uh, they're going to suffer, right? You're, you're going to have this sort of uh, nihilistic uh, um, uh, pessimism, right? You're, you're going to be sort of lost in, in a bad way. And that's like, oh, what's the point? Well, I may as well not even do anything because it doesn't matter if I uh, uh, do good or bad because there is no such thing as good or bad. So if I just kill and, and, and rape and pillage and take and, and be a raider uh, or I try to lead this pious life, it doesn't matter. The end result is I'm just going to die and uh, there's no impact on the overall universe for that. So that's what nihilism is. We'll follow and uh, human life will be de value. And he's absolutely correct. That is absolutely going to happen. People are going to try to find meaning in other things, untested uh, uh, traditional mechanisms, right? So at least with religion, we kind of know what to expect. But if we just reject this and let everybody float around looking for meaning that they can't find, uh, they're going to latch to these new ideas that we have not tested and we don't know what they are. And we don't know if they're dangerous or not. And there's arguably three things you could say that well, there's definitely actually four, but we'll talk about three that ended disastrously. There's three things that people sort of latch on to uh, as they uh, are going to continue to follow their intuition and feeling uh, as a source of truth, which, by the way, is what these continental philosophers suggest is the way to go. It's like, well, there is no such thing as objective truth, so just do what you feel is right, essentially. Uh, follow your inner voice, your inner feelings, your intuition, whatever it might be. So when people do that, there's a few ways they go. Some people continue this route. Right? That's liberal democracy, which we know has worked and succeeded. But there's kind of three other ones that are a little intermixed that absolutely did not work and were total disasters. Uh, and all they did was increase suffering and death. Uh, and that's going to be uh, the following three. And again, two of these are kind of interlocked. Nationalism. Uh, the end result of that's going to be, of course, World War I. Uh, and you can say World War II as well, but certainly World War I. That was the first uh, industrial warfare or war, and we just absolutely massacred people on untold scales uh, as far as absolute numbers anyway, like total big numbers. Percentage-wise, it wasn't our worst, but uh, it definitely was in actual absolute total. So that's going to kind of throw a wrench in uh, people's just following their intuition and feelings. And this one's kind of linked this next one, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, so you could say hyper-nationalism, but I'm going to say uh, uh, far-right collectivism, and I'm going to just say specifically fascism uh, or national socialism. I'll say national socialism because that's probably pretty accurate. National socialism, uh, or as you would know, of course, the Nazi party, the national socialists, uh, or fascism. And we know how that ended. That was disastrous as well. That's just millions and millions and millions of deaths, World War II, the Holocaust, all of that genocide, and uh, uh, the, the, the workings of Hitler and, and Mussolini and Francisco Franco and others. Fortunately, those died off uh, miserably in failure. But uh, we did uh, nonetheless have to endure a solid 30 or 40 years of that crap, and, and millions and millions of people died and suffered under those. And the one that people know less about, but you guys uh, do or will, and that's the actual socialist regimes. Those, uh, those top-down, centrally planned, one-party uh, socialist regimes, all of them failed, 100% of them, uh, the exact same uh, ways, which we'll, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but just know, for all the millions of bodies that... Uh, uh, and deaths and suffering that the National Socialists and Fascists were responsible for, and they were millions. It was like amateurish compared to what these socialist regimes did. Um, 
So this is like uh, uh, the Soviet Union, China, uh, Cambodia, Ethiopia. I mean, there's there's Ethiopia, Venezuela today, Ethiopia, Cuba, uh, Venezuela, uh, Tanzania. Like there's there's a bunch. All of them in the same way. Uh, millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people, over 100 million actually, uh, killed at least just in the 20th century alone. Uh, and then and countless more um, um, suffering as well, having to flee and uh, being imprisoned and starving and whatnot. So he is absolutely correct that people are going to be sort of floating without meaning and they're going to try to find it. Uh, and they uh, do disastrously uh, find it following one of, or you could say one of these two, um, um, ideologies based on their intuitions and feelings. And socialism, national socialism, and nationalism itself were all responsible for, for unparalleled suffering and death. Uh, and Nietzsche predicted that largely uh, with this explanation of like, watch out, if we throw these away uh, and people are left to just make things up, they're going to uh, rationalize whatever they already have available, they're gonna follow their feelings, and, and, it, and it's gonna be uh, a disaster if not done correctly. So that's the bad. But Nietzsche does try to offer um, um, an alternative or an explanation. And that's going to be, um, um, how can I phrase this one? So this is obviously bad uh, in that whether it's the direct death and suffering or even just, let's say, none of these happened. And it's just people wallowing in anguish and, and not finding a reason to live. Uh, that's also uh, a form of suffering. So whether it's you suffering personally and internally or people suffering and dying uh, in reality, uh, that's going to, or in the physical world, uh, these are, those are all bad outcomes. So his suggestion is, um, no, you should follow these things, but your life is basically a struggle to uh, grapple with this. So he suggested first this sort of like three-step process of like, first of all, understand the traditional system that there was, maybe even adhere to it in your young years uh, to figure it out. But then you should, once you've figured it out, challenge it and reject it. So he, he kind of like used this analogy of like be a camel and take on a burden and follow it as planned. But then as you are more aware of how imperfect it is or the fact that, you know, objective knowledge doesn't exist, you challenge it uh, and then you create your own system. So uh, life is a struggle. So you're supposed to basically um, uh, take action in pursuing your Subjective, meaning you just use a person. Subjective, um, inner voice or feelings uh, to find meaning. So he actually saw it as a uh, as a um, ultimately, you know, if you could, you know, somehow shift past this phase and the disasters, which we unfortunately didn't do a very good job of. Um, but he thought it was actually freeing because these are actually limiting. Right? Even though they do give you meaning, they are very strict and like you have to do this, 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 and this. And that could limit you. Like if I want to create a new machine or explanation for the world or uh, <clears throat> for physics or art, uh, I can't do certain things because my religion might say that's bad. Right? If I say something goes against the Bible, even though it might be true in our world, I can't do that. So it limits you and limits uh, you reaching your potential and, and, and finding meaning and, and decreasing suffering in the world. So uh, he thought that you should struggle through to find your own meaning in the world, uh, find a way to overcome your obstacles, embrace those obstacles as your obstacles, overcome them, uh, become a stronger person, and pursue that meaning that there is to you. And that way, and especially for people with this mentality, you can go out and you can make whatever you want uh, uh, without any limitations, no strict rules uh, or, or subjective uh, limitations. No, there's no, uh, there's no such thing as good or, or bad. Uh, so you shouldn't be limited on pursuing your, your own meaning or dreams uh, uh, or, or projects. And you can use that as a free mechanism to uh, make your life meaningful and, and hopefully by extension making that meaningful for other people as well. So <clears throat> that, by the way, is kind of how most uh, of this branch of philosophy that we call existentialism uh, believes existentialism. Uh, one of the early uh, existentialists, along with, you could say, Nietzsche, uh, would be um, uh, Dostoevsky. He was Russian, and he had a, he had a very similar set of beliefs. Uh, he was highly critical of how people lived uh, their world, uh, he was very much aware of all the psychological 
not all of them, but some of the psychological elements of our mind that drive us. And I think he was the one that suggested, even if we did find these utopias that uh, all of you are, are, are speaking of, these German idealists or, or these positive uh, uh, enlightenment idealists, uh, even if we had that world, humans would destroy it just because humans like disorder uh, and humans like trying to fix or better that disorder. So if there was a utopia, we'd all be just bored. We'd have no struggle. We'd have no reason for existence. So we would intentionally break it so we could try to fix it again. Uh, and he's largely right, I believe. So existentialism kind of begins here in the 19th century, and that's kind of their, um, that's kind of their root for meaning. It's like, no, there isn't one that exists metaphysically before and after and during us, regardless of whether we're aware of it. No, uh, you find your own meaning uh, in, in life by, uh, by pursuing that uh, through your own struggle uh, and finding meaning that way. And their they're kind of uh, calling card is this um, phrase called existence proceeds or comes before uh, essence. So that basically says your meaning, the things that you find fulfilling and meaningful, uh, they don't exist before you. You come into the world and find out what they are. So it says you coming into existence uh, is actually what uh, creates the meaning for your life. Like you find out what it is by living your life and struggling. It doesn't exist and then you're born and you, and you fulfill it. Uh, it's actually that your existence uh, makes that meaning possible through uh, that struggle and, and, and embracing the struggle and, and becoming more powerful or aware as a result of that. So that was all highly complex, but what's really important to know here is this is when uh, German philosophy, after Kant, and of course the French roots in Rousseau and Hegel, really uh, explicitly hammer down and reject uh, and offer a solution uh, to uh, uh, this positivist scientific rationale uh, explanation for the world. And uh, this doesn't get over into the English and American philosophy or philosophical community till uh, the 20th century. So that this is going to be maintained in England and the United States largely, with some exceptions with Romanticism. But eventually this bleeds over into the US and England as well. Uh, and then that's going to uh, result in existential movements. And then after um, World War II, uh, the postmodern movement, which is a period four topic. Existentialism is as well, but it definitely starts here. And now if, if you go into period four, um, if you're in a, not this year, obviously, because we're not going to have period four in 2020. But uh, all future years, uh, this is where your roots for existentialism exist. And guys like Dostoevsky in Russia and Nietzsche here in Germany, other Nietzsche here in Germany. So the continental philosophers, um, like I said, the earlier ones like Kant, Hegel, and then Nietzsche, who we actually talked about, uh, they're going to challenge scientific uh, theory, not just theory, the scientific process as a means to acquire objective knowledge uh, and truth. And they, of course, are going to reject science and rationality as, as the means of acquiring that and turn instead to uh, uh, feelings, like your intuitions and feelings and faith. Uh, and that's going to continue onward and still exist today in, in various uh, fields of philosophy, like I mentioned, with later existentialism uh, and then postmodernism um, and, and deconstructivism and all that. Uh, but we'll get to that in period four. Uh, for now, I want to pause and have kind of an uh, interim because we're going to go to the science and this is kind of this is definitely a science psychology is absolutely a science it's a social science like this which sort of studies human behavior um, but it was really really a very new field in the 1870s 80s and 90s uh, and most of it was based on purely just um, our senses like what we can sense and then what our perceptions of those senses are um, and you don't need to know that but what you do need to know is there's uh, one guy that comes along that's very skeptical of this uh, scientific method as their way to explain the world and our behavior and, and humans and society um, and, and rationality and, and our conscious moral brains that we, we can make the right decisions and figure it out and act that way. Uh, another guy is going to like Nietzsche, going to reject rationality as the, the, the means for, for life and figuring out how we work and, and what we do. Um, and he's going to emphasize the irrational. So um, intuition and emotion would be considered irrational, uh, absolutely, because logically you would only do things that benefit you and your others in the future. Uh, so something irrational would be just lashing out because you feel it and not having a reason for it and, and making your life worse. Uh, that's irrational. So Nietzsche was absolutely an advocate of the irrational. A lot of those continental philosophers were with intuition and, and emotion. Uh, and also a, a gentleman named Sigmund Freud, who you've all probably heard of, 
uh, was a, uh, a medical practitioner and later a psychologist who also is going to be very, very skeptical of um, scientific rationalism and, and, and reason and the scientific method uh, as a way to, uh, to, to find truth in how we operate. Uh, he's going to emphasize as well uh, the irrational uh, and the, um, uh, uh, how can I phrase this? The irrational, unconscious mind. So conscious mind is, I'm going to do this, and this is why I'm going to do it. And you go and do it. Like you say, I'm going to write my paper for school. And you're like, I need to because I need to get a grade. And you go, okay. And you go and you sit down and you write the paper and you, and you get it done because of the good grade. You didn't feel like you wanted to. You're like, no, I know I have to do this. It's the right thing for my grade. That's part of my goal. I'm going to go do it. That'd be your conscious mind. Um, the unconscious mind, though, is uh, the irrational one, the one that pushes you and drives you to do things that maybe you don't even consciously want to do, like, uh, or acts against your conscious mind, I should say. So, like, let's use the paper as the example. You've got to write a paper for school. You need that to get a good grade, uh, to uh, get to a better college or get a better job and, and make your life better in that way, get smarter, whatever it is that you want to do it for. You can think about why that's a good thing. Is it fun? Probably not. Um, but it's really hard to do that. You can't just be like, all right, and you do this and go do it. Uh, a lot of times you won't do it or you'll delay it to the absolute point of, of procrastination at the last minute. Maybe it's worse because of that or maybe you don't even end up doing it. Um, why do we do that? Uh, he's gonna provide explanations for why we do that. Even though I know this is the right thing to do, I know it's the logical reason, it's for the future, uh, yet I end up not doing it. I find any other reason to do anything. I clean my room or I uh, respond to emails or, uh, or texts or I make TikToks or watch TikToks or whatever it is, you're an adult or a teenager, whatever it is, uh, you find any reason not to do it and you're happy to do that. Maybe you regret it later, you probably will. Nonetheless, you do it though. You know this is good for you and you continue not to do it. It's the same thing when people try to you know, form habits that are, are, are good for their health, like dieting or exercise. The odds that they're gonna follow through that are very low. Uh, even though they know it's a good thing and they want to do it, something stops them from doing it. It gives them sort of this feeling of discomfort, this disgust, it makes them not able or easily able to go and do it and then they do something else instead that's fun and in the moment, uh, but that's irrational and what we call unconscious, uh, the unconscious mind or unconscious drive. So like, I'm not exactly aware of it, but I know that it hates the idea of doing that thing and it wants this other thing that makes me happy right now at this moment. All right, so Freud uh, emphasizes this. So his uh, theory is going to be predicated on the idea that we are not rational beings driven by uh, a conscious Oops, conscious, rational mind, but rather, and we're not completely devoid of that, but we're definitely not entirely that. In fact, we're actually going to be mostly not that. And while his theories specifically are going to be uh, incorrect about his emphasis on aggression and sexuality and, and in these, these stages of development, they're not going to be precisely accurate, uh, but he's going to point us in the right direction to what is later going to be accurate about how, yes, we are actually profoundly, in fact, mostly driven by these, um, these, these features that the German philosophers were highlighting in continental philosophy on feeling intuition, uh, as well as our behavior. That is largely what guides our behavior. We have a feeling, we do or don't do something, and afterwards we try to explain why we did it. That's mostly, that's like 90% of our behavior. 10% uh, of it is us going, I should do this, and you do it, uh, and that's the reason why you did it. But most of what we do is an instantaneous response. This is the psychology part uh, that we know now. You learn AP Psych about emotion and motivation um, and personality. Those motives and emotions that make us want to or not want to do something, we act on them, and then after we've already done the thing, be it good or bad, uh, we then try to rationalize it. Oh, I did it because, you know, I needed to, uh, uh, I haven't cleaned my room in days and I can't focus on my paper until I clean my room or, oh, I just had to reply to my friend and, you know, I hadn't, hadn't actually talked to them in a while and I, I really need to make sure our relationship stayed uh, solid and, and, and blossomed. So I, I had to put that off and that's why I had to uh, actually uh, send all these TikToks with my, with my friend. Like, we'll come up with reasons why we need to do things, um, but we're not really actually acting that way. Like, you didn't decide that, when you decided not to, or when you didn't write your paper and instead you just spent the afternoon on, on TikTok, you didn't go, 
all right, I gotta write my paper. Oh, well, I know I want to, but I really should actually reconnect with this friend of mine uh, and, and make videos of them or share videos or, or film them together or, or watch their suggestions or whatever it might be. Um, you actually go, oh, you get that feeling of disgust, like you don't want to do the thing, then you pop your open your phone, you do it, and then you, uh, while you're doing it or after you're doing it, when you've already started, you're like, oh yeah, I, I haven't talked to this person in a while, I want to make sure they stay friends with me. And, so then you, then you rationalize it afterwards. Um, so we are rather not driven by a conscious rational line, um, um, but we are driven by a, a impul an impulsive, irrational, uh, unconscious mind. All right, so it's not the only thing, but it's by majority the 75 to 90% thing that actually drives our behavior. So again, let me quickly recap. You don't think about something and go do it most of the time. Most of the time you have a feeling of like excitement or, or disgust and you either do it or don't do it. And then after the fact, you um, uh, rationalize why you did that. But you actually just act and then explain it afterwards. Uh, so your conscious mind's like more of an agent for trying to explain why you did something even though you just did it because you wanted to or felt like it. All right, he's gonna point that out. And he's actually have a whole theory based on that. Uh, and again, these are not accurate. And I'm not gonna talk about his stages of development and his emphasis on, on sexuality and aggression because that's an AP psych topic and an interesting one. And one if you wanna see, I have videos on that, but, um, or other videos on that from other people, uh, if you find mine a bit boring, but hey, uh, it is what it is. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it is a, a specifically not correct, like technically, but um, uh, overall, at least a framework uh, or an idea or perspective that is on the path towards correct as far as our minds, how our minds actually work. So uh, he believed the mind is composed of roughly three parts, the id, the superego, and the ego. And I don't know exactly what percentages, I've seen various um, Venn diagrams and, and What's the word I'm looking for? Illustrations of what percent is unconscious or unconscious, but pretty much just assume this. Most of this uh, superego and id and even parts of the ego are your unconscious brain or mind. So this is what I'm, I'm not aware of. I have feelings and I do things, but I don't know why I do them. Like there are certain things we all not, not everyone universally, but you subjectively, there is almost something certainly that you enjoy and also something you probably detest. Why is that? You could probably explain a reason why, uh, but your body will and your mind will like or dislike that thing instantaneously regardless of, of you thinking about it. Uh, maybe afterwards you can come up with some rationalization, but most of what we do, things we want to do uh, and things that we end up doing are unconscious. We do them and then we try to figure it out later. Or we're having a problem, we don't know why, because there's some sort of issue here. I'm not fulfilling my unconscious needs, uh, so they're, they're affecting my life negatively by coming out when I don't want them to. Uh, so anyways, most of this is your unconscious mind, and then, and then a, a sliver in comparison would be your, your conscious mind that you're aware of as to why you're doing things, why you do things, and you think about them, and then you do them. But that's not, not frequent. So what are these, these random terms I just gave? All right, so again, keep in mind, most of this is the unconscious mind uh, down here, and this is more so your conscious mind. So your id, super eagle, we'll do those two first because these are almost completely unconscious. Your id is your impulsive uh, brain, your primitive brain. Uh, it's the selfish one, essentially. So this is the one that makes you indulge on things. All right, so your, your, your propensity or the desire to uh, like foods that are unhealthy uh, or, or uh, engage in sexual activity uh, in an ex unacceptable manner or in an unacceptable rate or uh, break your monogamous bonds with your partner. Uh, all of those are, are selfish, impulsive drives. Um, using aggression to get what you want uh, and just running over others without any concern for them, that would be a, a drive of the id, right? And his major focus, I'm not getting super detailed, his major focus is about how these are primarily sexual and uh, aggression oriented. All right, so he's not entirely correct in that. Certainly those are partly drives. Lust and aggression are strong motivations in humans, but they're not the only ones. Uh, but that's what those are. So these wounds we can agree mostly, generally speaking, are good for us because they feel good, whatever it might be, but um, usually in the long run, they're not good for us. Uh, like 
you could eat yourself or smoke yourself or drink yourself into an early grave or an unhealthy life or relationship. Uh, you could be um, uh, too aggressive or, or too sexually promiscuous to the point that um, you end up suffering some sort of, some sort of con consequence like an STI uh, or unwanted pregnancies uh, or ruin relationships with people you want to maintain, maintain relationships with but you're unfaithful so you can't or as far as aggression, you hurt other people or you cause them to dislike you and hurt you in return or go to jail or end up dying because of this violence, whatever it might be. Uh, these are things that might feel good in the moment, but they uh, are bad for us in the uh, long term. Super ego is kind of the opposite. That's your altruistic uh, uh, drive. It's kind of like the conscience. So this is like the Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder saying, hey, you shouldn't do that. It's bad to do that to people. You know, um, you're in, this is like the devil on your shoulder and this is like the angel on your shoulder if you want to think of it like that. And the ego is kind of like uh, what you actually do. So this is you and what you actually carry out. So like you have a desire to eat that candy bar or instead uh, eat a carrot, right? Because let's say you're on a diet for whatever reason. Um, you got the, oh, it's a conflict. It's gonna be two things. Uh, this is my uh, altruistic uh, brain. This is my conscience. Uh, this is the one that uh, seeks what we typically find or think of as morally good and virtuous, right? Being helpful. Uh, being mindful of others, uh, doing things that are in our, our best interest in the long term. Uh, and these two things are constantly competing for what we actually do. So this is what I actually act out. So if you want to think of it like that, this is the you, and these are your shoulders. There's the devil and there's the angel. And they're, every time something comes up, they're battling for your actual behavior. Like, uh, oh, I want the candy bar. Well, I want the carrot. Right for, for whatever the uh, actual uh, decision is, and you're sitting there, uh, and there's a candy bar and a carrot, and then whatever you end up pick, that's what your ego ends up behaving with or ends up going and doing. All right, so that's kind of what it is. So if I pick up the carrot, super ego one. If I pick up the id, or pick up the id, if I pick up the candy bar, the id one. If I take a piece of the candy bar and a piece of the carrot, then they compromised in some way. Uh, and that's how we believe largely our uh, behavior acted uh, unconsciously. Nonetheless, uh, when we have that moment of pause and we look uh, and, we, and we don't think, we just grab one or the other, that's when one of these ended up winning. Uh, and to add one more uh, layer to this, um, he believes that if one of these is not being realized enough, so let's say you always go with this, uh, it's gonna overwhelm you according to him at some point and this never getting its way is just going to uh, take over and dominate your behavior against your own will. Right, so you might really stick well to that diet for the first week or two, but eventually your id's gonna become so repressed and unused that it's gonna lash out and you're gonna break down by, uh, by, by, by cheating on your diet uh, or, or whatever it might be. Right, you can use any example. It could be, uh, you know, if you are, what's a selfish thing that we could use as a helping someone out or, or taking it? All right, how about a, uh, an example is uh, you sharing with your sibling, right, as you're a kid, uh, and uh, you have an opportunity to share. Your brother or sister wants to borrow your toy. You're not even using it right now, but you don't want them to use it because I might want to use that. So you say no, and you don't let them do it. It's like, okay, you're at one in that, in that instance because you were selfish. You didn't let them use it, even though you might not even be using it yourself. Um, okay. But the other side of that might be, oh, you actually do let them use it, even if you are, uh, because you know that uh, if you do that, then in the future, they're more likely to, uh, to uh, share with you. So if you overuse this, eventually you're gonna feel guilty. Uh, and if you overuse this, you'll eventually uh, be just pent full of, of resentment and bitterness and just lash out and end up getting what you wanna get. Uh, and so he's gonna argue that. So what we're looking at here is my behavior uh, is largely irrational. Uh, I just, these two things battle and I do things and I don't even realize why I do them necessarily. Uh, and even if I go to try to go backwards and try to rationalize why I chose this or this uh, option, uh, I don't actually know why, I just do it and then afterwards I explain it. So that's what his uh, main focus is gonna be. We are mostly irrational beings that act uh, according to our id, generally speaking. Uh, we are largely impulsive, uh, and even if we are acting in the interest of others, it's mostly unconscious drives where I'm either fulfilling a selfish desire or I am trying to uh, get some sort of uh, good feeling or avoid guilt for not 
acting in the uh, uh, um, uh, interest of others. By the way, I shouldn't have put conscious here, right? I should put conscience. There we go. That makes more sense. So that's the uh, Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder. All right. That's pretty much what Freud did. And again, his specific theories are not correct, but the way he saw and explained the, the perception or framework he provided for, oh, we aren't just these rational beings that do whatever we think is good. We actually act on our feelings and then explain them later. Uh, that's going to be uh, 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 largely true. And uh, he also says, and this is also true, it's really hard to, if not impossible, to get rid of it. So if I've just naturally got a really, really strong, impulsive uh, uh, id, it's going to overpower my ego, superego, most of the time. And there's probably little or nothing I can do about that. Uh, and then, of course, his methods of psychoanalysis are trying to figure out why this thing is taking over so much and to try to uh, alleviate it so it, it's not as in control as much and it's more balanced uh, between the two. So that's what he's going to explain. Again, not specifically right, but along with Nietzsche, correct in that we are not these purely scientific, logical, conscious uh, robots that can figure things out and act. No, uh, we're actually dominated by our intuition, our feelings, and these irrational, unconscious drives. Uh, and again, they're going to be largely right. People are going to go a little overboard in the early 20th century, late 19th century, but mostly the early 20th century, uh, even mid 20th century, on how right these guys are. Um, but nonetheless, they are, uh, they, they are, they are correct. And regarding psychology, there's almost no cases where it's black and white, like this is always correct and this is always wrong, or this is the one perfect explanation and there's no other partial explanations or other factors. What you can find in history and psychology is it's almost never just this is wrong, this is right, it's a combination. And just like this uh, scenario, um, is it all 100% unconscious mind? No. Is it mostly? Probably in most cases, but uh, it's definitely gonna be a combination of both. So don't go overboard in thinking, like I mentioned before, that, oh, because I'm driven by unconscious things or because Nietzsche said that everything's subjective uh, as far as your perception and things, right? Uh, that I should live based on my feelings and nobody else matters. Uh, and my actions don't matter and I should just act on them selfishly. Because that's not entirely correct either. Because if you want to think of it like that, if you're trying to achieve your goals and, and, and pursue uh, your meaning, uh, regardless of all others, if you just go out and do that, and make everyone else's life worse, you're not gonna get what you want anyway. In fact, you might end up in prison or, or dead, depending on the circumstance. So, um, partially right, but um, <clears throat> those positivists uh, and enlightenment uh, uh, um, uh, rationalists before were not 100% correct, uh, and these guys pointed it out, but also no, they're not 100% correct either. Uh, both have valid points, and both uh, combine to uh, uh, explain what we do, why we do it. Uh, and why we enjoy things and why we don't enjoy things and why we have it. So that is how those two philosophical and then uh, psychological movements challenge and break that idea of uh, positivism and their emphasis on this sort of idealistic scientific method explanation for, for all things uh, and, uh, and this idea that we can all utilize a rationality and reason uh, uh, and mind to uh, to act and achieve that perfect progress and utopia. Probably not going to happen. Well, it isn't going to happen because these forces are equally, uh, if not more, um, uh, responsible for our, for our behavior. So that's that. Next, we're going to talk about uh, how actual physical science is going to sort of contradict itself uh, or at least cast doubt on its own dependability um, or... Uh, or discredit it to some degree, at least uh, at least the past discoveries. So that's what these guys do. They don't disprove positivism and science completely, but they do discredit it as a um, complete explanation for how to live and explain the world and find truth.